in Southridge. It is good to have you here this morning. And if you're new, my name is Brent. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, I want to ask your forgiveness a little bit. Uh, the service that you've experienced so far today is not quite like the normal service we have. We don't usually have a nice big ad in the middle of it for Southridge Connect. But I do want to say it is important for us as God continues to help us grow or causes us to grow, one of the things that we struggle with with growth is community connection and communication. And this uh, Southridge Connect is one of the tools that we're using to help foster that. So I do encourage you after the service, go sign up, get connected into Southridge uh, Southridge Connect because it is for our community here at Southridge. This past week... um, number of things occurred and I, it really brought into focus for me the, the impact one life can have. Uh, for those of you who, unless you were, I don't know, camping outside, far away from the TV or social media, uh, you, you probably heard that uh, Billy Graham passed away this week at the age of 99. And uh, there's been lots of tributes given to him on social media. You know, he has the title America's Pastor. And um, I read one, one article that said, that estimated that he had probably spoken either live or on TV and reached over 215 million people with the gospel of Jesus. Yesterday, I also had the privilege of uh, taking part in a celebration of life for Muriel Nolson. And although I didn't know Muriel really well, uh, it was evident to everyone who was here that she had had a tremendous impact on her family. And uh, thinking of those two things, it was, it, was, it was pretty amazing to see that two individuals in very different ways could impact other people's lives so profoundly. And, that, and as we live in a culture that often discounts a Christian's life, a Christian's point of view, uh, it was amazing to just hear those stories of those two individuals last week. And so it got me asking the question to myself anyways, what would it look like if our church was actually having an impact on our world? What would our church look like? And I know that's maybe not a question you wrestle with or even think about all that often, but as a pastor, it's one of the questions that I kind of contemplate, one of the questions that kind of helps me evaluate how we're doing as a church here at Southridge. For those of you who, who were here last week, you know we're starting a series, or we started last week, a series in 1 Thessalonians. So I encourage you to open your Bibles to chapter 1. We're, we looked at the first half of chapter uh, 1 last week. This week, we're going to look at the last half. So starting in verse 5, the second half of verse 5, all the way to verse 10. And I think it's appropriate because in this passage, Paul has some things to say about what a church looks like that actually impacts the world. So starting at the end of verse 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. And if you're wondering what that is, basically those are two provinces that made up the country of Greece in Paul's day. So basically he's saying the, me- the Lord's message rang out from you not only in Greece, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn, from God, or sorry, turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. When I first read that passage uh, in preparation for this message, there was one sentence that stood out to me, and it's verse seven. And in verse seven, Paul writes this, and so you became a model to all believers. Some of your translations might have example. So you became an example to people everywhere to the church globally, you became an example. And as I thought about that, I I thought, hmm, what is he saying there? What does he mean? And I just, as I was thinking about it in my own head, as well as I know church and the Bible, I thought, okay, this is probably what he's talking about. You are believing the right things. You're a model. You're behaving the way God expects you to behave. You prioritize kingdom values. 
you're accomplishing the mission God has given you. But is that what Paul is saying about this church? Jump back to verse five and look at what it says in verse six. He says, you know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. What is he saying here? I've entitled this message, Becoming a Model Church. Becoming a church that is worthy to be patterned after. What I believe Paul starts off by saying is in here is a model church has people that are worthy to be imitated. When he says, we were with you, you imitated us. What he's saying is himself, Paul and Silas and Timothy, those are the authors of the letter that are writing to the Christians here in Thessalonica. We lived with you, so you got to know us. And you, light, and you saw us. And when he says, you know us, what he's saying there is he, he isn't saying you just listen to our words. What he's saying is, is you actually saw us live life in your midst. You saw us day by day living what it looks like to live a God-honoring life. If you jump ahead in chapter 2, verse 10, and we're going to get here in a few weeks, but let me just read verse 10 of chapter 2. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. He's reinforcing the fact there, just the next chapter over, that they had lived in such a way that the Christians, the believers in Thessalonica, could look at them and say, okay, I need to imitate them, because if I imitate them, I'm going to live the way God wants me to live. Because I know that they're living as God wants them to live. And I think this should be a caution for us modern day Christians. One of the things that we have access to that the early church never did was the abundance of teaching. We have the ability to go online and listen to a pastor preach a message. We have the ability to go online and listen to a podcast that details great biblical knowledge. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you understand what Paul is saying here, he's saying it's, it's not just that you listen to our words. It's not just that you believe the truth we were saying, but it's that you could actually look at our lives. You could actually see us, how we interacted with persecution, how we interacted with the good things that happen in life, how we interact with the crossroads of life and we have to make a decision. It's at those moments that you actually got to know who we are and you could see our character. You could see the values that God has given us and you could see how we interact with life. You never get that if all you do for your discipleship is watch, a, is watch something online or listen to a podcast. You see, what I think Paul is telling us that in a model church, in a church that is worthy to be patterned after, You have those people who we should imitate. But it does us no good if those people who we should imitate, who are worthy of imitation, if they don't allow us into their lives. You see, discipleship is about getting into each other's lives and being able to see each other live life through the good stuff and the hard stuff. And so in order to become a model church, we need to have people who are worthy to be imitated, but those people have to allow people into their lives in a close and personal way so that people can actually get to know them. What I think Paul is saying here is that you need biblical community in order to have a church like the Thessalonians did. You have to have biblical community where you spend time with people because that's the only way people get to know you. People don't get to know who you really are just if you talk to them on Sunday morning. People don't get to know you if you just follow someone's Facebook posts. You need to be able to spend time week in and week out rubbing shoulders, discussing the truths of scripture, discussing life's circumstances, the hardships and the benefits. And only through then do you build the trust that is necessary so that you can then turn to the person and say, hey, I admire how you're living your Christian life. I want to imitate you. I want to become a believer just like you are. But that never happens if we don't get to know, really know somebody. Hebrews 13, 7 says this, remember your leaders 
who spoke the word of God to you. Great, great verse, but he doesn't stop there. He says then, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. The only way you can consider the outcome of their life is if you get to know them, right? So what made this church a model? Why why could Paul hold them up and say, okay, Church of Christ, here is a group that you can pattern yourself after. I think it's found in verse 8 and 9. What does Paul say there? The Lord's message rang out for you. I think there's three things that Paul points to that allows us to understand what a church should really look like. The first thing is their message. The message they proclaimed. The NIV has the Lord's message. The the word of the Lord rang out. So what he's saying here is that the Christians had taken from Paul and Timothy and Silas all the good news of the gospel. They had put it in their hearts and they couldn't contain it themselves that they actually had to let people know. It rang out. The picture here is of a trumpet being blasted. They couldn't contain the message that was in their heart. They couldn't keep it to themselves. A model church has to proclaim the gospel, has to talk about the good news of Jesus Christ. Rick, I read an article this week written by Rick Warren, who's a pastor and who uh, had Billy Graham as one of his mentors. And uh, in Christianity Today, he, he wrote this, Billy Graham never lost his focus. His focus was always about bringing people to Christ. That was his singular life focus. He goes on to say in part of the article, I remember when Billy Graham received the Congressional Gold Medal in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol in 1996. There were about 400 chairs packed with VIPs, President Clinton, the leaders of the House, the leaders of the Senate. They were all there addressing Billy Graham. They spoke and got up and honored his life and his achievements. But what do you think Billy Graham did when he got up to speak? He spent maybe three minutes acknowledging the honor and how little he deserved it. And then he said, let me tell you about Jesus. And spent the rest of the time talking about Jesus. And even though the event was all about him, he turned that meeting towards Jesus, the focus of his life. Billy Graham is quoted as saying this, it is not how many people I can get into a stadium, but how many people I can get the word out to. And the word here is the good news of Jesus. The Thessalonians were known for the message that they gave. They couldn't keep it quiet. So that everyone who came in contact with them knew exactly what they believed. Exactly what they believed. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on after talking about the message that rang out. It says, and your faith in God has become known. So the second thing that a model church, I think, needs to have is faith. And it has to become known. And let me ask you a question. How do you know someone has faith, real true faith? You only know when it's tested. You only really know if your faith is real and solid when it is tested. Not in the good times, but in the hard times, the tough times, when you need God and you can turn your back on him. It's those moments when your faith gets tested. And it says here that their faith was tested. They suffered severely. In spite of severe suffering, verse 6, their faith proved to be true. If you know the story at all, it comes out of Acts 17 and and Acts 17 tells of when Paul and Silas arrive in Thessalonica and and Paul goes to the synagogue and, and preaches there for three consecutive weeks and a number of Jews are saved, a whole bunch of Gentiles and some important women of the city are saved. And because of that, the rest of the Jews, they get a little upset, they get a little jealous, they get a little angry and they start a mob. And so the mob goes to a a house and it's owned by Jason. Looking, they're looking for Paul and Silas to bring them out and beat them and do whatever with them, but they're not there. So instead of Paul and Silas, they just grab Jason and a few others and they take him out and they take him, you know, it's almost like a lynching. 
The Christians in Thessalonica knew what it was to be persecuted. They knew what it was to suffer. And so Paul is saying, look, the whole world knows of your faith because when it came time to be tested, it was tested and proven. That's what a model church displays. That through the tough times in people's lives, through the tough times as a church, our faith is tested, but it still stands. And then he goes on to say something interesting. He goes in verse 9, For they themselves, and these are people talking outside, other Christians from other parts of the world, report what kind of reception you gave us. I think what he's saying there is that the, the Christians, the Thessalonians here, were known for their hospitality. They took Paul in, they took Silas in, they took Timothy in. They took them in and protected them. They were hospitable, they were generous. And when they needed to send them on their way, they sent them on their way. And they did it in such a way, and we don't have details, but they obviously did it in such a way that it became known to the rest of the churches, the rest of the New Testament churches, how they were hospitable to Paul and Silas. Generosity. At the uh, Celebration of Life yesterday, part of, the, part of the service, I had a whole bunch of the grandchildren stand up here, and they're all in their, like, their 20s and 30s. And what they did was they just shared a memory of grandma, and they just kind of went down the line. And um, one of the th- themes, and actually one of the grandchildren said this, home is where grandma is. And they weren't talking about, you know, grandma being in heaven, but they were talking about the fact that whenever, wherever grandma was, wherever they came into contact with grandma, that was home. And you could go to grandma's and she would welcome you in at any time. And if you were hungry, she fed you. If you just needed someone to talk to, she just sat there and listened to you, made some tea, made some muffins. If you needed a nap, she had a couch you could lay down on. Whatever you needed, when you went to grandma, you just knew you would get it, and it was home. And it wasn't just a physical location, it was wherever she went, it was home. And that's kind of the picture I get that Paul is sharing about this church. A church that is a model church is one that is hospitable, it is generous, it shares what it has, it welcomes people in. And so it begs the question for us this morning here at Southridge, what is Southridge known for? What are we known for as a church? Are we known for our message? Are we known for our faith? Are we known for our hospitality? Are we a generous church? Are we a church that is not afraid to proclaim what Jesus has done in our lives? Are we a church when things get tough, we turn towards Jesus and we don't lose our way? We don't lose our faith. Do we have a passion to see Langley and BC and the world come to know Jesus? Is that true of us as a church? Is that true? Last week when we looked at the first five verses of Thessalonians, one of the things we talked about is that when someone comes to Jesus and experiences Jesus, their life changes. That's a mark of salvation. The Holy Spirit comes into their life, gets a hold of them, and just totally renews them. They become a changed person. And so as Paul goes on to finish this chapter in verses 9 and 10, I think he gives us an indication, three characteristics of a person who is changed, but more than that, a person who is actually worthy to be imitated. And so not only do we have to consider the question of what it is for us as a church to be a model church, and if my presumption is correct, a model church has model people in it. It has people who are worthy to be imitated in it. You can't be a church that is, be, that is worthy to be patterned after by other churches if you don't have that church made up of people who are worthy to be imitated. And so what does Paul tell us in these last two verses about the type of person who is worthy to be imitated? I think he has three things. Verse nine, he says this, they tell how you turn to God from idols. Number one thing, a person who is worthy to be imitated. 
is someone who orients their lives towards God. They have turned their life from following their own pursuits, their own ideas, their own passions, and turned to God and say, okay, God, what do you want for my life? What do you need me to do? Greg Rochelle, in his book, Liking Jesus, tells the story of a friend of his who was visiting India and uh, at, at one point came to this remote village, a poor village, and as he entered the village, he observed this woman outside of her house uh, killing a chicken. And she was killing the chicken to offer it to the idol. She was doing a sacrifice. And so as he watched, he, he said, he was so shocked to see such a blatant modern day idolatry. He'd never experienced that before. And so instead of just being repulsed and walked away, he decided to go and talk to her. So he went up and started a conversation with her. And as they were talking, he became very impressed by how well-spoken she was, how educated she was, and how kind she was. And as they were talking, he learned that she had visited New York City about three years earlier. And so curious, he, he asked, well, what did you think of New York City? What did you think of America, the U.S.? And this was her response. She said, I hated it. I've never seen more idolatry anywhere in my entire life. Kind of took him back a little bit. And so he pressed into her a little bit and said, hey, can you tell me what you saw? She said this, first, Americans worship their stomachs. Her eyes went wide as she talked about the massive stores she saw overflowing with food selling to people who already had too much to eat. And evidently, this woman was offended by the people who were overweight when so many people in her village had to go hungry. Second, she described how Americans worship their television. She said, from her perspective, they design their homes around the television. It takes the most prominent place in the most important room the furniture is arranged not for talking with people, but for watching television. It was almost too much for her to comprehend that some people even allow television into their bedrooms. This one stuck a little, struck a little too close to home for me. <laughs> then third, she said, the worst form of idolatry that she saw was people's relationship with their phones. She was deeply offended that people used them while driving. And even worse, from her experience there, she couldn't even have a full conversation with someone without them checking their phone. You see, when we're not paying attention, when we, we just live life in our culture, we can allow idols to take shape and form in our lives without even realizing it. And sometimes what we need is an outside perspective to bring some clarity to what is actually going on in our life. It's so easy to allow things to take the place of God because that's what an idol is when it, something t becomes more important than God in our life. And whether that's sports, whether that's even our family, whether that's even our spouse, it is so easy to allow those things to slip into priority in our life rather than God. Whenever something takes precedence in our life over God, it has become an idol. This week I was reminded of this. I was having a conversation with one of our kids and uh, we were just talking about how important, and this is a, a a phrase that Pam and I have used with our kids over and over again. It's one of our family kind of phrases. How important it is for our children and us to have a soft heart towards God. The only way you orient yourself towards God is by having a soft heart towards him. You see, because what happens is, is when we sin... And when we're in sin, sin comes in and it starts to harden our heart. And when our heart gets hardened, we turn ourselves away from God and we start looking and focusing on other areas, other things in our life. But it takes a soft heart, a heart that is willing to hear from the Holy Spirit, a, will, a heart that is willing to be convicted of the sin in our life to turn and orient ourselves back to God. 
And so what Paul was saying is the Thessalonian Christians had a soft heart towards God. They had turned away from the idols. They had turned away from the things that their whole life had been driven towards. And now they had oriented themselves to God. And that's how they were living life. But it doesn't stop there. He says the second characteristic of being, of someone who is worthy to be imitated is someone who serves the living God. Not only do you turn to God, orient yourself to God, but you also serve the living and true God. There is a phenomenal verse in Acts chapter 13, verse 26. And in that passage, Luke's recording, they're talking about King David and his life. And Luke records these words, for when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He died. We are called to serve God. And what that means is we have to identify and discover God's purpose for our own lives. And each one of us has a different plan that God has for us, a different path for us to walk down. Not everyone has the same purpose. And that was made abundantly clear this week to me as I thought about Billy Graham, as I thought about Muriel and their lives. They both served God's purpose in their own lives and then went home to be with Jesus. Billy, he was asked to be a public figure. He was asked to be an evangelist. He was asked to do crusades. He was gifted that way to do that. Muriel, she was asked to be a mother, a grandmother, a great-grandmother. Public life, private life quiet life. Either one of them can have a powerful impact and leave a lasting legacy as long as we are living the purpose that God has designed us to live and we are willing to do what God calls us to do. A person who is worthy to be imitated has their heart oriented to God, is serving God living out their purpose. And then the third thing that Paul just highlights here is that they are waiting for Jesus to come back. They're waiting for Jesus. And there's this idea that I, as I read that and what fills my mind is this. We know as believers, we know as followers of Jesus that this life is not real life. Our real life starts when we get into heaven or Really, maybe that's bad phraseology. The life that we're really anticipating is the one in heaven. This whole piece until that time is just preparation for what's going to be there. And so there is an anticipation for those who are worthy to be imitated. They live their lives with anticipation that as we go through life, this is not the end. Death is not the end. It is but the beginning of what we really are called to become. We have this expectant hope. But we also know, as he finishes verse 10 and says, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. We know the reality of what the scripture says about wrath. We are saved not only to something, but from something. And we're going to have a chance to get into that a little later in chapter 2 as well. So I ask you the question this morning. What type of person are you? Are you the type of person that others should imitate? Are you the type of person that Paul could hold up and say, this person is worthy to pattern your life after? Because they have their heart oriented to God. They serve God with their whole life and they're expectantly waiting Jesus for Jesus to come back again. Is that you? Here's the good news of the gospel. If that is not you right now, it is never too late to become that type of person. The good news of the gospel is this. God can take anything can take us, no matter how messed up we are, no matter how bad things, how screwed up we have Let our life become because of son. He can take that and turn it into something amazing for God. He can take our life, reorient it, and turn it into something amazing for him. 
It is never too late to become a person worthy to be imitated by other believers. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this morning. And Lord, we thank you for your word. And to be honest, God, this passage is a challenge. It's a challenge to us as a church. Can we be like the Thessalonians? Can we be a church that is known for our message, our faith, our hospitality, our generosity? Could we be that church? And more importantly, God, can we be a church full of people who are worthy to be imitated because we are living our lives in such a way that you are our God and that we love you so much that we are willing to do whatever you ask us to do. And while we're doing that, we're expectingly waiting for Jesus to come back again. Lord, may that be true of us here at Southridge this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.